I thought I knew what I was doing. Like I read this book and I was like, oh yeah, ace queen is a trouble hand. And like all these like cliche terms and I thought I knew what I was doing and like I just ran with it, but it was like my own thing. I couldn't quantify it really. It was just like, I know these guys fold too much. I don't care about money. And that's like the biggest advantage you can possibly have in poker is find a bunch of people that give a shit about what's in front of them. My only purpose was to want whatever the next guy above me had, whether it was a sponsorship deal, an article written about him. I was just all in for two years and it was the most hectic up and down ride that was always going to end with me being broke. It was LaManna and I, and he was taking full advantage of my degeneracy. We had like a little bit of like allowance money or, you know, maybe from like a little odd job would have a little extra money. We wanted to gamble with it. So we would like hang out at Berkey's grandma's house and we had no idea what we were doing, right? But we tried to figure something out. We saw like the older kids playing. So we're like, oh, let's try it, you know? Yeah, my bed used to be here. I had a couch here and we would set the card table up right in this area. I was just like one of those circular ones and there was like five or six of us that uh, used to play. I never like really enjoyed gambling, but I enjoyed the idea of being better than people at stuff. As his sibling, you know, I was very competitive myself and it got to a point where I was like, I'm just, he's, he's intense. I can't, I just can't live up to that level. So we were playing different variations of poker, mostly seven card stud variations with wild cards like Chicago which is high speed in the hole gets half the pot Kings and Little Men Fall of the Queen Midnight Baseball a game called 357 I refused to play any stud game by itself I was actually the one who taught them both how to play poker specifically he taught us uh, no limit hold and he had saw rounders we understood the actual rules of the card game like what beats what, how you use community cards. But we were used to playing stud, so blinds eluded us. There was no betting before the flop. It was just like you got dealt your two cards, and then we put the flop right out, and then we would start betting. Yeah, I taught two professional poker players how to do this for a living. So if you need me to teach you, like, you know, you could be the next star on the circuit. So it was me, Brian, and Skimpy that were kind of like vying for the always in the winner circle category. And then it would be Berkey and I battling it out at the end. And everyone was rooting for me because he would all win most of the time. So every time I would win, everyone got all excited. Yeah, and like losing to him was unbearable. I was like the annoying kid to him. And yeah, he was, you know, arrogant, I'm best at everything. By the time we were 15, we actually started playing poker often. He was like my adversary that I invited to the game, not like one of the boys. So we were close at like growing up fourth, fifth, sixth grade. And then we kind of veered away from each other because of our personalities. You know, you stay on your side, I'll stay on mine kind of thing. And it just led to this like back and forth to where we scheduled a fight. We just like kind of couldn't stand each other for a while. So it all came to a head. And I remember I had a Legion game for baseball earlier that day. And like one of his friends was just like, what time is it going down? Six o'clock, whatever. It's like, yeah, I'm gonna mash his face in. And it's like in the back of my head, it's like, God, I hope we don't throw any punches. Uh, so we get there at this girl's birthday party that we were both invited to. And there's this big, like dramatic, okay, how's this gonna go down? Like, are we gonna box? Are we gonna, what, what are we gonna do? We're like, we're setting the ground rules. And then like, you know, we push each other, it's like, come on. Like, all right, all right, hold on, I gotta take my necklace off. And we're like, putting our jewelry and a hat and stuff. And it's like, all right, let's go. And by this time, the girls had arrived and they're crying, like, stop ruining my party and everything else. Like, yeah, all right, fine. We just won't fight today. And then after that, things kind of blew over and then became friends again. Um, we have to send her $3,600 and she is sending us hats. T-shirts, notebooks, 
and she designed the felt. All right. I know we're selling the posters. Are we selling the hats and the t-shirts? Are we just giving those away? Is I have. I think. I think. Hmm. I haven't decided yet. We only have twenty. I've been wanting to get Lamana involved for a very long time, and I didn't necessarily know how. And we kept like thinking of ways he could be involved from a poker capacity. But what actually ended up coming to be was he has decent managerial skills. So he's able to kind of step into that role and alleviate a lot of stresses that I'm taking on, and it's well worth it. And now all of a sudden, we're a team. Um, but the thing is, is that like, you know, we're really, we're never gonna make a lot of money on this stuff. No, no. You can see is, the margins are small. So right, it's like, right. it's more just. It's almost like if just breaking even is fine because you're getting, you're getting right. the advertisement out there. Right, right, right. Same kind of thing with the posters. The posters were like $800 to get 300 of them printed, yeah. but most of that was just upfront cost. From being very young until the point where I started like playing with this group, I put a very tangible value to money. I remember when I bought my first car, I was 17 and it was like 15 years worth of birthday money. You know, it was difficult to hold on to money as a kid. My mom ever found out that we had any, she would ask to borrow it and she would swear she was gonna pay it back, but it's like she's making promises she couldn't keep. So the way to circumvent that seemed to be to make your money work for you. And it's like, if I would cut grass and make 20 bucks, well, it seemed like I can outwit these other four guys to earn their $20 too, and now turn it into 80. Yeah, you could definitely tell he was good. He knew when his hand was good, when it wasn't, when, when other people were weak and he could apply pressure to them. At that age, it was, it was painful to lose to me. Oh yeah, they'd wake me up. Um, they're just shouting matches at two and three o'clock in the morning over a hand and they're playing over pennies. So the penny jar was what we used for chips. Nobody had chips back then. Now everybody has a, a set of chips. Berkey had this giant jar of pennies that we just used that would symbolize quarters. When we first learned Hold'em, we knew that it was a no limit game, but just the nature of the way we played. Certain bet sizes were just the most anyone would ever bet. So he would find different ways to win and he found out a way that he's like, oh, here's an exploit. Nobody will call a big bet. I had this infamous move of just betting the entire jar of pennies. He would sometimes just grab the penny jar and just go boom and just stick the whole penny jar in the middle and he's like, this is what I bet. If you want to call it, call it. And he just knew nobody would ever call. If somebody would have called the jar of pennies, we would have counted them out one by one, multiplied it by 25, and that would have been your debt. Basically, I was just putting people in a position where it was like, they didn't want to have to owe. And just the fear of being in debt through gambling, I think, was enough to, to probably earn some tight folds. Sometimes he had it, but I think looking back, most of the time he was bluffing when he threw the whole penny jar into the middle. It sounds like a piece of shit to play with. <laughs> yeah. Well, ask some, of, ask some of his opponents now.